Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Okay, guys, today hey, I'm here with Dan Istvanik. Did I say that right? Pretty close. Istvanik. Istvanik. And I heard some guys pronounce it. I meant to ask you before about it. That's all right. But Dan is with me tonight, you know, where, wherever you are. It's going to be day, night. Who knows what it's going to be for you when you're listening. But he's been in student ministry for 28 years, 28 plus. He's a veteran. You know, and one thing that we're talking about and looking at in this student ministry podcast or Youth Worker on Fire is longevity. Um, what happens when you stay? You know, it seems like as long as I've been in, 18 months is still kind of like the average. I don't know if somebody came up with some new stats. I know people don't last long, but there's more of us lasting longer than there used to be. Absolutely. Because of the very thing that we're talking about and doing. And so 28 years plus, you know, congratulations to you, Dan, and your family. That's, that's a huge deal, uh, number one. Uh, he's got Youth Ministry Hub, www.youthmenhub.com, if you want to go there and take a look at that. He's currently a family pastor just outside of Chicago. Been creating and writing beyond the walls of this church for about 15 years. You can go there and take a, look, a quick glance at some of the places that some of the things that he's doing. And we had talked about, he said, hey, here's some topics we can talk about. Why students choose sports over your youth ministry? Well, let's just find out. But anyway, no, we're not going to do that right <laughs> now. Uh, multi-year scope and sequence teaching. Teaching, not preaching. That's a big one. Seven-minute rule. All of them are big. Seven-minute rule for effective teaching. Uh, another topic, making every week special. Raising the bar on professionalism. Defining success in ministry. Partnering with parents, effective family ministry, the difference between middle school and high school ministry, making every week special, using games for effective and engaging teaching, why I chose, why I chose to uh, lead with my spouse and family, being social media savvy, why leaders fail, avoiding burnout, seasons of youth ministry, friend to father, my 10 biggest mistakes in youth ministry we all like to hear everybody's mistakes, <laughs> over 28 years, uh, Christ-centered versus student-centered ministry. Those are all the things that Dan sent to me. And I said, Dan, you know, we'll, we'll touch on some of that, but I don't want to focus on one of them. I want us to just focus on you as a person because you know what? They're going to come find you for these things, and they can go and hear some other places. But what a lot of people don't do is focus on you as a person. Because one thing that we as youth pastors, youth workers are, is we're people, we're people first. I forget where I heard that. <laughs> anyway, we're people first, you know, and we had lives before we did this. We have lives outside of that, even though it's a calling to many of us, those who are lasting, I believe we're on a mission, not just a ministry job. That's my intro to, for you uh, <laughs> on that. And you're at Avenue Christian Church, right? You still there as a family pastor? I am. I have been about just under three years. Okay, under three years at that particular place. So, you know, that's my interest. So tell me, what are some other ways people can get in touch with you? I like to do this right up front. Are there other ways that we can get in touch with you that you like for us to do? Absolutely. I mean, we. I mean, I'm all over social media as far as uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can find me all, all there. I post, repost a lot of the things there. Uh, conversations I have with others, I post there as well. Uh, we have a few Facebook pages that we also oversee through Youth Men Hub. We have uh, a great resource called uh, Game Hub, Youth Ministry Game Hub, that has a ton of game resources, but also just everybody shares together. We have a great spot there. We also have Middle School Hub, and then we also have a Chicagoland Youth Worker Hub as well that helps people kind of interact with each other within the Chicago land. So we have a couple of ways you can reach me, a couple of ways you can find me and my resources. And uh, I'd really try to make myself very, very available. My wife and I 
our secondary calling to students beyond students is to really serve youth pastors and their spouses uh, nationally. Is everywhere we can be, we want to be there and be available. Um, these way is distvanic at youthmanhub.com. Uh, you can email me anytime you want. If you don't don't want to do that, you can message me through social media. I try myself very, very available to talk, to pray, to just offer counsel, offer advice. Um, sometimes just sometimes people just need somebody to, to vent to, and that's fine. That's where us all want to be. And let me tell you, if if anyone's been in student ministry or any ministry for more than five years, and most more than two, but more than five years and more than ten years, then more than fifteen and twenty, you've you've hit some battle walls. You've gone through some tough, tough times. For sure. So we're gonna we're gonna look at some of that too. Here's what I these are some common questions that the audience is used to. And the reason I do this is because I want them through us to also see what are the real connections that flip that switch that put us on the path that we're on Absolutely. in our adolescent years. Absolutely. So here's my question to you. In your adolescent years, it could be 11 to 25 because that's adolescent for men, you know, but uh, your teenage years or, or even college, but that one person, other than your parents... Now, there's some people that go, you know, our parents were the only ones that were there. Okay. But other than your parents, because we were figuring your parents were great people, but who is that one person that just kind of flipped that switch inside you for something in your life? I was actually blessed uh, with two, two uh, teachers in my life at the same time. My ninth, 10th grade years out of Christian school. I had two men in my life that uh, just breathed life into me, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, You know, as kind of was trying to rededicate my life to Christ, they said, hey, we really see in you a calling to ministry. I said, no, absolutely not. My dad's a pastor. I don't want anything to do with that. (laughs) But these two men in my life continued to pray over me, uh, mentor me, put up with my crazy questions. And through those guys, they encouraged me to take at least one year, go to one year Bible college, just go to one year Bible college, there's a Bible college nearby, if you're about an hour away, just take one year associate's degree, nothing but Bible, make a foundation of faith for yourself beyond your Christian school years, and then, you know, see what God does. And they they tricked me, they, they got me to a Bible college, and that's where God started working because of them, uh, came home, took a summer or semester off to work, pay off that bill, and 19 years old, that's when a small church asked me to help them uh, really honestly start a youth ministry. A little bitty church, had a vacation Bible school, a bunch of teenagers from the neighborhood showed up, didn't know what to do with them. And they kept coming to church after VBS was over. And they so the church said, hey, we have a fellowship hall next door. Would you want to hang out on Wednesday nights during prayer meeting, get these students out of our prayer meeting and hang out with them over <laughs> wait, 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 social I hall. like that. Get these students out of our prayer meeting. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Was, <laughs> there, was all, there was a group of students that just kept coming. They would come on Wednesday nights. They'd come on Sunday mornings. And they, this church was like, hey, we need to do something for them, particularly for them. So at 19 years old, all by myself, I was in a little fellowship hall next door to prayer meeting with 15, 20 middle schoolers and high schoolers just doing life, doing Bible study, literally winging it as I went. <laughs> and then uh, once a month, they would have a prayer, during prayer meeting, they have a business meeting, they'd take a special offering and I would get a love gift. <laughs> and uh, that's great. That year in January, I went back to Bible college, different Bible college and continued on my education and just continue to follow God's calling in my life from then on. But it happened through two, two godly men that were willing to put up with me and uh, my questions, but also some of my attitude. Right, and, and if and if they'd had anything to do with PKs, uh, pastors, kids, and For sure. uh, missionary kids, they they understood the pains that you're gone through. One of the reasons I never wanted to be in, in ministry. Period. I wanted to, I wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do as long as it wasn't in a church. That's my words to God. Absolutely. Because yeah. my best friends were youth pastor. I mean, were pastor chil- children. And uh, stuff, and I just saw how brutal that was on them. And it didn't matter what part of the country or the world. It, it's, a, it's a tough place. Yeah. T- tough place to be brought up and live. So it's always some other adults usually in a teen's life. It's seldom, sometimes it's another teen, but a lot of times it's a coach, it's a teacher, it's, it's, another, it's somebody like that. And uh, that's why you and I, that's why everyone who's listening is so significant. So. What's your story? How did you come to know Jesus in the first place? What was your first encounter with Jesus as personal for you? Well, being a, being a PK brat, being around church, um, 
honestly, my first encounter was, you know, an early age decision uh, through my dad, um, you know, five years old, just hearing a story about salvation, about Jesus dying on the cross. Um, honestly, even I was at a pretty conservative church. We, I heard a little bit about hell and I was like, all right, I have a conversation. So my little five-year-old, six-year-old brain uh, talked to my dad about that. Um, but later on in life, I mean, you know, fifth grade, going to sixth grade, really going to high school, uh, learning a lot more, choosing to be baptized or immersion is, is the church setting I was in. And so, you know, first encounter with real faith was early on. I mean, it was really funny. I went to that little Bible college I was referring to and, uh, I went up going to a church and lo and behold, my, my, uh, Sunday school teacher when I was in five and six years old ended up being a part of that church. So I ended up while that year of me being away from home at a Bible college, I ended up having dinner with her and her husband numerous times or attending their church. And so, you know, literally 15 years separated, 14 years separated from this, this lovely, amazing young older lady. And here, lo and behold, God brought her back into my life later on when I'm in college Hmm. And then being a part of her church again, different church altogether than when I grew up. And uh, just that's where God just continued to kind of bring people back in and out of my life to encourage me to kind of reveal his calling in my life. So that's huge. That's great. Yeah, there seems to be that childhood thing with some pastors' kids. I know it was the same with mine. All three of them came to know Christ in a different way, but there was something about that five, six, four, five, six year old tender spirit. You know, and, and and not too young. We keep thinking. I thought, you know, youth pastor, come on, need to be middle school or something like that. And uh, well, that's why I, I'm I'm a huge proponent of children's ministry and middle school ministry. Um, because I mean, 85 percent of people who accept faith now are doing the age of, between the ages of four and 14. It used to be that we're getting kids to get ready to go to college. Uh, youth ministry is now getting kids ready to go to high school. Yes. Um, you know, 85, the bigger percentage is happening between the ages of four and 14. It's that four to 14 window in children's ministry and youth ministry. And uh, that's why I love what I do is living in that in that moment. Well, I tell you, in, in middle school, uh, I was trained by Youth for Christ. And so in high school, that was our main training. But yet I had to deal with middle school students and I had to deal with co- college students in, in, uh, on a city level basis through those guys. What I found over my years, I love all of those age groups, but middle school has a special place in my heart. And what I believe I found, and you can respond to this, is it's the most creative time in a person's life. And it's also probably one of the most honest times in a person's life. You can get less honest after that. And so uh, I found that uh, several people, their, uh, their middle school dreams were the dreams that took them through life. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the second half of my ministry has really been focused on middle school ministry and having my my influence on the other parts of ministry. Right now, I'm a family pastor, but my actual student ministry position is still hanging out with middle schoolers. I have a great children's pastor, I have a great high school pastor with me. Um, my high school pastor work, you know, works with beside me with middle school, but I'm still the middle school pastor, so to speak, at our church. And I've done that for 15 years now, is working specifically with middle schoolers. Uh, I call it middle years. It's fifth to eighth grade. Uh, a lot of people don't don't loop that fifth grade in, but I think fifth grade is the is a big beginning stage of next step faith. Yeah. So fifth to eighth grade is what I call a middle years. And that's where I've been. That's where I've been for the last, you know, last half of my career has really been focusing on that, those final big decision points in, in youth ministry. Yeah. I'm amazingly creative and and vulnerable years for us to be there for them. And my philosophy is if a middle schooler loves you and knows you love them throughout middle school, they're your friends for life. Absolutely. If if they find that they don't like you, they might not be your friend for life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it goes both ways on that one. So, um, so tell me this. At what point did you want to just give it up? Wow. I mean, you've been in 28, 28 years. Come on. You know, you we know. In fact, may, maybe we better hit you with, no, no, no. Let's just go there because I got other questions on that line. That's all right. There's been a couple pivotal moments where we've had to sit down as a family and talk and make some decisions um, what God wanted for us. I think one of those was... Um, during a, my my time at Washington D.C., I was serving a, a church there, uh, and in the contract we were on contract. So it was a, you had a one year contract, and you went year to year. Um, and my one year contract ended 
and we couldn't find a place fast enough in next next spot. And um, we actually had to give up our town home. The way DC culture is, you have to rent lease from year to year, and there's only a short period of window of time to lease if in a military culture. So about you know, 65% of our church worked for the Pentagon. So there's this rotation of, of uh, coming in, coming out. So rentals are a big deal. So you pretty much have a month or two to rent or not rent. And so our landlord looked at us and said, if you cannot commit to a full year, we have to, I have to just ask you to, to move out. And so we went through two months of being uh, literally homeless. So we lived, we packed up everything we owned into two pods, packed our essentials into two, our two cars. And we lived with friends. We lived in hotels. We lived with family and we spent two months as homeless uh, while still interviewing for churches and feeling like God continued to still call us to ministry. But there was definitely moments during that time, uh, definitely looking at my kids and seeing them go through this, that I just wanted to say, hey, is, is this is this still for me? Am I ready? Am I done? And God opened some amazing doors and continued to kind of affirm that. Even our kids, even as young as they were at that point, affirmed it in me and in my wife that you know we as a family are still called to youth ministry. And that was a big moment. And that was a big moment in our lives. Uh, another one was recently, about three years ago, when p- the pandemic hit. Uh, the church I was serving in Philadelphia uh, laid me off. Just said, hey, we're at a point financially. We've already committed ourselves financially. And we really cannot sustain your position as the, the lead of campuses. So as the lead campus pastor overseeing youth ministry across our campuses. They said, hey, we can everybody can do their job on campuses, but we don't need you necessarily during the pandemic. And so I had to go through a layoff. And that's honestly what kind of why how God brought me here to Chicagoland was uh, through a couple months into COVID is being laid off. And that was one of those moments where once again, we sat down with our kids, sat down as a family. Um, my wife would say, we know we want to give you guys, you, it was kids, the opportunity. And at that point, my kids were almost teenagers and a teenager. And we said, hey, you know, what do you feel like God's doing in our lives? We're called together as a family and they went for a walk. My wife and I sat and prayed in the house. Our kids came back for a walk and said, no, God has still called our family to continue to do youth ministry, continue to serve students wherever he has us. And once again, one of those moments where mom and I are like, you know, hey, this is, are we done? And we have two, a junior hire and a senior hire looking at us saying, no, you you need to continue to do this. We need to continue to do this together. And those are those moments of, uh, the inspiration. People ask me, you know, why have I done this so long? There's various reasons how, how God's kept me in it. But one of those is uh, God has truly called my family and my kids have continued to be a big part of, of why I continue to do this. That's, <laughs> that, that, that is an amazing story. And I, I know you're not the only one, <laughs> but that, that is uh, to, to a dad uh, or, and by the way, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Kristen Lascola. She's a youth pastor. I was yeah. looking for the, you know, Kristen. Yeah. So, you know, if you oh, d- get Kristen. a chance, listen to her on the podcast because we talk about a lot of the stuff. We split it up into two sessions, even though we did it all in one. But, you know, for you as as a guy, for your wife and your, are they two girls? Your, your, your I have children? A, I have a boy. I have a boy and a daughter. Who's the oldest? Yep, son who's, and daughter. The, who's the oldest? Oh, my daughter. Your daughter is. Okay. And uh, for them to say that, for them to, to, to be there behind you and to say, no, no, not only are we, are we not behind you, we're beside you, uh, we're with you, we, this is painful for all of us, but we know this is a, a God thing. That is huge in a parent's, a parent's life, let alone a pastor's life. Hugs and love to your, your family, your kids, and your wife <laughs> on all those fronts because those are some amazingly painful moments. And unfortunately, that's what people are going to go through, something like that if they stay in long term. There is no guarantee. But the other side to that is some of these things like, uh, was that were those your worst ministry moments, those two? Um. I'll give those, I'll give, put those in the top five. <laughs> the top five, okay. <laughs> Tell me your best ministry moments. The, oh man, there's, God has done so many neat, neat things. Um, honestly, my, my ministry moment is, it's going to be my kids, me being, having the opportunity to baptize my kids. Uh, Cause I think so many people define success in so many different ways, but you are not a successful 
as a youth pastor unless your own personal kids follow Christ with their lives. And that's one of the ways I define success is my kids in these conversations that we just talked about, but them saying, no, I, we want you to be part of our spiritual journey. We want you to, we want to be baptized together. We, you in the water with us. Um, that's the youth ministry moment for me is when my own personal kids, you know, chose to take the next step of faith and continue to do so. So to me, that's that's my highlights. Well, that should be your your big highlight, and that's for sure. And what that says to a church and a family, you you weren't doing it for this, but what that says to a church is, oh, we really want this guy and his family to be here because they are together, and that's rare. And unfortunately, that's rare in many cases. Unfortunately, wives and children are drug along, which is one of the things that I, I did not like about looking at full-time ministry before I ever went in. But I'm blessed. Amazing I'm blessed. story. And, and, and yeah, you are blessed. And, and you're not the only one, once again. But I think it's a smaller percentage than we'd like to think it is. And that's a huge deal. Tell me your funniest, funniest student ministry moment. Oh, my gosh, funny. I, I, I'm just trying to think. I mean, there's, in the top 10 of, of funny, weird moments, I think uh, my one of my funny ones always sticks out to me is uh, we have a retreat going on come, you know, a few years back and it was right around the same time. It was on the national news, but there was a a man that had a private zoo and um, he didn't want to give up his animals. So he, I mean, unfortunately committed suicide, but before he did so, he let all the animals, animals go, including his lions and his tigers. Oh, wow. And so we're about to go on a retreat the next weekend. And I was getting phone calls from moms and dads who were canceling on going to the retreat because for fear that a a lion or a tiger would attack them during our retreat. And I had to over and over explain to them that it was an hour and a half drive from where we were, that these, uh, these animals were, and that it would take an hour and a half drive for a lion to hotwire a car and show up to our retreat. (laughs) But they still did not want to sign up in, in, in case, in case a lion or a tiger would attack their child during the, the fall retreat. So that's one of the ones that sticks out to me is those, like, why do, you know, one of the funniest moments, like, you know, why do kids not go to your retreat? What are the excuses you've heard over the years? Like the best excuse I've ever heard for not signing up for something or, or canceling on going something is they were literally afraid of a lion or a tiger attacking their child. So <laughs> normally you have to take them on foreign mission trips to get that response. But for sure. in your case, no, it just came to you and, and say, mom and dad, it's just, uh, you know, we're just thinking of it as a mission trip, okay? And, you know, no, that, that's, that is hilarious and scary. It's scary. Uh, but fortunately, the lion and the tiger were, were captured only a day or two later. And these kids had already, parents had already signed, already canceled. We canceled their, re, their reservation for the retreat. They lost their spot. Oh, no. And the lion and tiger were back where they belonged or something, I guess. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Tell me your top two, one or two games that you would say, listen, easy. It works almost every time. Here, here's, here's the top two I'd tell you about. Man, I mean, over the years, I mean, my, my top games are always twists on, on, on the classics. So I, I think one of the ones that my students have loved for 20 plus years is shaving cream baseball. It's simple. It is a wiffle ball bat. It's a wiffle ball. And because the wiffle ball, wiffle ball has those holes in it, um, I just fill it with shaving cream over and over again. Every time I pitch it, it is full of shaving cream. And by the end of the game, everybody's covered in shaving cream. Shaving cream is spinning out of that ball everywhere. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any good teaching value in that, other than maybe, you know, what in, what's inside matters. But my kids, my students have loved that. Um, some of the other classic twists. Um, well, I got to say right there, that that is... Uh... Uh, all kids are going through uh, usually uh, acne, Doctor Pimple Popper. You know, I, I you know, oh, yeah. I, I wish Doctor Pimple Popper was off, and I knew about that particular <laughs> game. I would have used it. So, <laughs> go ahead though. You're going. You had another one. Uh, I mean, just dodgeball. I mean, I, oh, I, I don't. We don't play normal dodgeball anymore. So we have a variety of. I think about about thirty different versions of dodgeball that we play. Yeah. Constantly replacing replacing the dodgeball with different things. Recently, we're playing rubber chicken dodgeball. We took the, the oh. you know get that good rubber chicken, get a good flick on it. It's not going to hurt anybody. It has a nice good squawk as it's coming at you. <laughs> That's always quality. And seeing it, seeing it. Middle school get corked to the head with a rubber chicken. That's always quality, right there. It, it is. It's uh, you know, it's it's those life moments that lead you to Jesus, and I think. But anyway, <laughs> uh, 
I think, you know, we, I, I first want to say recently, I mean, that, you know, you bond over laughter more than you bond over, over tears. Yes. And those moments that you can, you can look back and go, man, that was a funny moment. Those are the things that stick out in our students' minds. And so we're like, oh, well, you know, we don't play games anymore. We don't do silly stuff anymore. And I'm like, maybe I'm old, but I still find that when we do games, when we laugh, we do silly things, that stuff sticks with my kids way more than the serious tearjerker moments. Yes. Yes. Uh, especially lessons. And we've actually done something unique in that we put, so often we'll put games in the middle of a lesson as a, as a moment of just a brain break or to use it as an illustration. So halfway through a lesson, I'll stop and we'll actually put the game right in the middle of the lesson instead of doing it on the on before or after a lesson. And those are moments that students really, really engage with a concept because they're physically doing something in the middle of their learning. It's that kinesthetic, hands-on, minds-on learning that really changes what you're doing and keeps you and allows you to be able to teach a lot longer. That's where that seven-minute rule that I have in ministry happens is every seven minutes I try to do something different when I'm speaking, when I'm teaching, so that kids continue to stay engaged. And one of those things is about seven minutes into a, uh, a lesson, or 14 minutes into a lesson, I'll do a game to keep them engaged in what I'm doing. No, that, that is brilliant because, um, once again, they're in between concrete and, and abstract thinking as middle schoolers, and once again, the most creative time in their life. So when you're throwing creative things at them and showing them action, there's one expert on middle school students, and he said decades ago, he said, the worst thing that we're doing is putting middle schoolers in schools. He said, what we should be doing with middle schoolers is we should be taking them out to build a house, to build a boat during those formative years and then put them back in regular school after they've gone through those years because it's the most, what I said before, most creative time in their life. Absolutely. So brilliant, brilliant that you're doing that. And if those people are listening and aren't doing that yet, I think that's just amazing and wonderful. Now you separate, it sounds to me like with some of the stuff I've read, that you separate middle schools and high schools completely in in ministry areas. Is that right? Absolutely. And other than my very first ministry when I was in college, that first church I talked about, I had been separating middle school and high school all 24 years of doing student ministry full time in a paid church setting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, there's no reason to keep them together. They're, they're not the same no. mindset. They're, there's nothing. No. And I found that my middle school uh, staff and my high school staff never wanted to switch. My middle school, you think, well, middle school staff, they want to go up eventually. No, they didn't. In fact, they said, do not move us. This is where we love it. This is where we'll stay. High school, we're the same. And college uh, staff, well, college students are just middle school students grown up. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> my definition anyway. So, uh, so anyway, we got, we got a lot of those things covered. What's some, something you really want youth workers full-time or volunteers to know that probably nobody's asking you, but you, you really think they, you wish they'd ask you this or... You'd like to tell them this. I think the big, I mean, the biggest thing that the people just don't really ask, but I, I wish they would, is how can we serve you? And not that I want people to to serve me, but what are the ways that we can, you know, come alongside you and serve beside you? Um, so often they're just looking for, you know, just a quick spot to plug in or things like that. But really, what are the things that people can do to really plug into walking beside me in ministry? Not just serving students, not just serving, kind of checking a box, but really saying, what does it look like to really, you know, take on a life of service with you? And I would love to to have more people ask me that question. Uh, you know, we have some young, you know, some high school students, some college students that come in to do mentorships and internships with us. But I would love to see and hear more adults asking, what does it look like for me to be more active in serving beside you in ministry. Yeah, that's those are excellent questions because you 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 want it to be caught. In fact, student ministry and, and ministry period is caught and and not taught. I mean, you can teach it, but it's like you can only teach it after they've caught it and they want it. Yeah, and so that is an excellent uh, an excellent place to go there and challenging to those who are are listening. And we've got all kinds of people listening. We got youth pastors and and volunteers. But uh, I also know that they're school administrators because I've, I've interviewed them for this podcast and yeah. in public school because I did a lot of things in public school and worked with guys for, and ladies for a long, long time. And they were amazing. And, and, um, and they gave us some incredible life lessons for us as youth pastors. One thing I would ask them, 
why did you want me? Why did you let me stay on your come on your your public school yeah. campus? Wasn't you know wasn't I a threat? Why didn't you Why didn't you kick me out? And we would talk about that and why certain people they were glad to see come and certain people they were not. Absolutely, you know. And they dealt with volunteers like we deal with volunteers too. And one thing I ask uh, one of them is, how, you know, uh, have you ever had to fire a volunteer? <laughs> and, she, and and this is a female. Um, principal and she says oh yeah i i've i've had to fire volunteers oh yeah she says usually i just <laughs> relocate them she said i don't i try not to fire them she says but i'll just say you know this isn't working for you here let's try you over here you know absolutely and, and we've had if you've been in a while you've had to ask some people not to work with you anymore at least for sure. in that particular area and so uh that's what that is but what are some things you want parents and grandparents to know? I, I want them to know that... And you're uh, in family ministry now, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, family ministry. I mean, my, my biggest thing is I, I want them to know that students, their children, their grandchildren, need them to be their grandparents and their parents, not their friends. Um, so often, I mean, parents just want to try to be that friend. Grandparents, they're in that, that stage where they're like, oh, I get to be the, I get to be the grandparent now. It's been just all fun. And those are great, great moments. But... Your kids, your students still needs parents to be your the parent. Like you need to lead and disciple from a place of authority. Grandparents, while it's fun and it's a new new season for you, they your students still need to hear faith stories and your godly wisdom. And so often or not, I mean, I talk to grandparents and they they've chosen to kind of take the hey, it's just fun fun grandma and grandpa, which are so it's so great, but they miss the opportunities to be generationally discipling their 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 grandchildren stepping back into this spiritual dis, the mentorship discipleship role that they could have especially from a pace of, of, of a generation removed it was so, it's so powerful when it happens it's so powerful and I know uh, guys like Walt Mueller and some of those guys who who've been doing youth ministry a long time but also are now speaking back into the grandparents and grandparent discipleship there's some great things happening through Walt and some of his group of guys that are are writing and speaking to grandparents about how to be uh, grandparent disciplers oh that's uh that is amazing stuff and um uh... Any any website or anything to go for that particularly? Oh, I got to pull it up off my top of my head. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you look through uh, CPYU, uh, Center for Parent and Youth Ministry Understanding, Walt has a ton of great resources there. And I believe um, on there you'll find some, a lot of his, his resources for grandparents and uh, great-grandparents, you know, how to do that discipleship model. That's great. That's great. Okay, guys, you know where to go now. He's You've got that down. Go back, rewind that, and get that so you can go see that. I know I will be since I have a three grandkids now. What is something people don't know about you that is really fun in your life? A lot of people just don't know that you know I'm a farm kid. Even though I've I've been serving a lot of times in cities, um, I'm a farm kid uh, through and through. I, my first job in fifth grade was milking cows and putting in hay. <laughs> and uh, everybody great. assumes that oh well, you know you always done youth ministry. You've been in you know cities, different settings. But uh, I'm a farm kid through and through, uh, old school, and uh, yeah, that's one of the big things that people don't realize. I can I can milk a cow if I had to. <laughs> Have you birthed a cow? Hey, did you ever birth any of them? I was part of part of some of that process. I didn't get to do it myself, own by myself, but I was part part of being a helping hand in that 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 process for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. I worked I worked on a ranch for five years, and when, when we were in transition. And stuff, and uh, I did not. We we were around the cows a, a lot, but we didn't we didn't birth any, and we didn't milk them. They were all, you know, they were all uh, uh, meat cattle. But we did. But I did do a lot of shoveling poop for horses. So, oh uh, yeah, yeah, in there. <laughs> yeah. How did you and your wife meet? Tell me about your love story. Oh, absolutely. We met actually met in college, but we never dated. We were just friends. And uh, we just were friends. I mean, she was uh, actually almost engaged to a, another guy. I was actually engaged when I left college with a, a young lady. And um, we parted ways. And I ended up taking my first youth ministry job in Cincinnati while my wife landed a Christian school job in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, you know, long story made short, we met back up after college, started hanging out as friends. I would go up and help her in her class, Christian school classroom. She would come down as a friend from college and help me do youth ministry and be a secondary second chaperone, a female chaperone in my youth ministry. And honestly, we really were just working on being friends and just kind of continue that friendship and God brought us together. And um, honestly, we never started, stopped, started dating. We never stopped dating. We just let God use our friendship to develop us to the point that we just wanted to spend the rest of our lives together doing ministry. 
she has some dates in her mind when the, you know, the first, I love you is the first kiss, maybe the first this or that. But honestly, we just started hanging out and let God lead us through our friendship to the point that we were, we were best friends and we had to get married. We were just, we were best friends. We didn't want to do life without each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's important too. The important thing is one thing I learned uh, before I was married was it's not who you can live with. It's who you can't live without. Absolutely. But, uh, that's where my wife and I are. It's, it's great to hear that story because love stories are very Im- important stories in ministry life and in life period. The Bible's full of love stories. Yeah. So that's why I believe love stories are important for this podcast. So any final thoughts for youth workers, Dan? My final thought, I, I, whenever I have these podcasts and people ask me that question is, is the word of affirmation is don't give up. Um, my wife and I's calling, secondary calling to students is to work with pastors, youth pastors, and their spouses or other women in ministry. And my encouragement is not to give up. Uh, that's our, our secondary calling is to really keep people in youth ministry for the long haul. Students need you. Uh, parents need you. The church needs you. Um, don't look at it as a stepping stone. Keep doing youth ministry. This generation needs you so very, very much. And uh, whatever happens, whatever discouragement, um, don't give up. And honestly, I am, as I said at the very beginning of the podcast, I am available. Uh, before you quit, before you give up, email me, call me, find me on, on, on social media. Well, I'll talk to you. We'll talk you through it. I mean, if God's really calling you away from it, I don't want to talk you out of that either. But I would love to be that voice in your in your, in your ear telling you that you can do it and you keep you can keep doing it for God. All right, guys and ladies, uh, you heard it here from Dan and you know you can call him. You can always get in touch with me as well on those uh, same things. Dan, listen, it's been amazing. And thank you for reaching out to Youth Worker on Fire. Yeah, absolutely. It's guys like you that we're interested in and ladies that are doing this in ministry because... Uh, I believe it's the most important ministry in the church. I know that we think of the senior pastor and all those. Those are amazing, important ministries. We are about the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And that's what Jesus was about. So thank you so much for serving. Thank you so much for going the extra mile these last 15 years in your uh, <laughs> ministry. Uh, to reach out to other youth workers and uh, families to to help them along the way. Well, thanks for having me on. Okay, brother. Listen, God bless you and uh, hope to uh, do it again. Call me anytime. You got my number. All right. All right. God bless. See you later. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.